Welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today, as always, we're on 89.3 Lakes FM in West Bloomfield, 88.1 WBFH in Bloomfield Hills, as well as Birmingham Area Municipal Access, our TV stations, Comcast, Channel 15, and AT&T Channel 99. On the web in high definition, civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link or join us at the small player at the top right of our homepage on your web browser on your computer. We're also on social media, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And as always, joining me here in the studio is Ronnie Dahl. Tyler. Yes. How do you not look like a drowned rat right now? Uh, it, it took me a lot of multitasking this morning to get the articles, of course, posted on our website, get everything ready for the, no, technically for the pre-show, other than, of course, these up lights, which I'll have to do at the first break, and all while simultaneously drying off. Because the situation, to set the scene for those of you out in TV and radio land, the parking lot here at Green Media Center is soon to be closed to the public. They are remodeling the parking lot at Chico Elementary, which, of course, we're on the campus of. And they told us that, hey, beginning Friday, which, of course, they told us yesterday at about 11 o'clock, beginning on Friday, your parking lot's cut off. You're going to need to park it in another spot. So, of course, this morning I was parking in another spot. I let Ronnie and the rest of our staff know that we needed to park in another location. And then uh, Jake had come in just a few minutes before I had when I had parked over uh, our good friends over at West Bloomfield Parks. And I said, hey, parking lot's open. They're not here. I'm guessing because of the thunder and lightning. I made a phone call and uh, to... Uh, the cable commission who said, yep, that's that's right, they're going to start on Monday, let Ronnie know, but she was already walking over, focused on staying dry, and in the process had seen my text message when she had already arrived, which, of course, I feel great about. <laughs> but, you know, for guys, it's not so bad for you right. guys. Oh, yeah. You don't have to worry about your hair. So I right. did, that's why I felt bad. Uh, I know. you know, make sure I wore my hair straight because I was like, oh, if I have to walk over, give it up, you right. know. It's over. No. And, you know, you have an umbrella, and but... It only no. does so much. My it's, arms were soaked. Everything else was fine, but my arms were just covered in at least mist, which, you know, not, not the worst case scenario. It could have been a lot worse. I could have, you know, had a car come by and... I had a nice big puddle, which would have been at least funny, but. <laughs> so, but it is Friday, but you dressed up. I dressed down. I was like, oh, no. But you know what is fun as an adult? Getting to um, break out your rain boots. It is. It's kind of fun. I don't get to jump in the puddles, though, necessarily, on the, at least not on your way in, because, you know, you're trying to you know, keep yourself as dry as possible. But on the way out, you know, celebrate. It's the weekend. Go jump in the puddle. Right. So for all the ladies out there, for us, hunter boots are always the fun thing to have in, you know, the yes. rain boots, but you could put the socks in them and wear them in the winter as well. But I probably have about 10 pair. Okay. Different colors, orange, green, black, shiny black, mid, mid height. These are my new ones and they're short, kind of like little boot things. And I think I've only gotten to wear them once. So I was like, ah, oh, you know, I oh, can, what a great day. Right. you know, Break out the rain boots, jump exactly. in some puddles. Exactly. We're going to have plenty of puddles to be able to jump in over the, uh, as far as we know, indefinite period of time that we'll be, you know, walking between here and wherever we park for the duration of the construction. How long is that supposed to last? That's a great question. <laughs> Tyler's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's my way of saying it. I have no clue, but <sighs> uh, I'm just as excited as you are. I will say, Tyler, I'm not feeling too worky today. Not, not, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those days where I even woke up and I'm, uh, as I'm walking out the door, and I'm just looking, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm getting my apartment set for the day, getting the cats ready, make sure they're not going to be, you know, getting into anything that they shouldn't be getting into on my way out the door. And I got to close my bedroom door and I notice it's super dark in there. And I got the lines like cracked open. So I'm like, okay, well, it's probably because, it, you know, it's just super dark outside and it's cloudy and it's raining. And so my first thought was, this is just peak sleeping weather if i were if this were tomorrow if this were saturday and i woke up at my you know normal time i'm a pretty early riser even on on the weekends usually my you know late wake up is you know nine ten o'clock at the worst and even then it's just like oh where, what have i done with my day today if i would have woken up at you know 8 30 when i'm heading out to come into work on saturday in this kind of weather i would be like hey, you know what I can sleep for another couple hours. That right? sounds fun. But today, it's like, that's all I wanted to do. That's all I was thinking about was how great would it be to just lay right back down right now? You uh, know? 
who needs a career, right? I got sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so when I left, I was lucky enough to walk Trixie in between the big rain showers. So it had rained early and then, you know, there was a break in the action. So I took her out. And uh, when I left, the dog was up on my side of the bed under the blanket. She looked like a, a person, like, you know, her head on my pillow okay. under the blanket. I, I was like, look at this. Look at this. It is crazy. Do you let your cats in your bed? Do people sleep with their cats? I don't people know. People do. I don't personally, just because they don't tend to sit still for very long. Uh, one of them does, Idle. She tends to sit still and, and lay there and will cuddle, but she needs, they both are very much needers. They will just, you know, kind of lightly claw at you and their claws are sharp, but they, they mean well. Whereas Jax, and he's just like a very boisterous, playful boy and he will just he'll lay there for a split second and then he'll just start climbing all over you clawing at you head button me he's 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 sweet but he's also a monster so i don't <laughs> he's sweet no. but a monster yes there's your quote of the exactly day. hey uh we knew the news was going to be coming right we did the governor rescinding michigan's gathering mask rules starting tuesday I always wonder, like, why start Tuesday? Why not right, just why not start just the like day now? We're good, you know. You like, did the announcement right. because it's not like you were putting more restrictions in place that would require businesses to, you know, make some changes. And, and some would be ready to go the day of and say, okay, well, we're just going to make the make the full change today, and we'll be fine. And others would say, okay, we're not quite ready. We're going to keep these rules in place for us until Monday or until Tuesday, so we have an adjustment. Instead of you saying, okay, I'm giving you all the the time that you need. Where was the time that they needed on the way in? Right. right. That's when they really needed it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so Michigan's remaining restrictions on gatherings and masks will be dropped next week, uh, ending the 15 months of broad limits on businesses and indoor activities here in the state of Michigan. Under the changes that take effect Tuesday, maximum indoor capacity limits are going to increase to 100 percent. The state's mask mandate for non-vaccinated people will be removed 10 days earlier than the original goal of July the 1st. Indoor capacity currently is capped at 50%. Now the decision marks the removal of the most significant remaining pandemic rules as infe infection rates rather continue to plummet and the percentage of uh, Michigan residents protected by vaccines continues to increase. So the Tuesday changes will occur 469 days after the state reported its first COVID-19 cases. Uh, some orders though remaining in place include those protecting individuals in long-term care facilities, prisons, jails, as well as a mandated COVID positive reporting requirements at schools as well as prisons. Um, Whitmer administration though expects to release updated guidance for students and staffs at schools sometime next week. Yeah, but not entirely surprising that some of these regulations stayed in place for places like long-term care facilities and prisons, places that don't necessarily have the full 70% or higher vaccinated rate to prevent constant spread of COVID-19 or significant spread of COVID-19 to unvaccinated patients or unvaccinated inmates in the cases of the prisons. Uh, so for now, until they get to that point, and especially with them having so much turnover in those facilities that happens over time, I wouldn't be surprised that, that they wait to lift the rest of these restrictions until the entire state reaches 70%, which honestly is going to be a while. For the rest of us, this makes sense that this has happened now. The, the state's been very quick to reopen since we've really since we've hit that 55 percent of the population with their first vaccine. And a lot of these uh, a lot of these restrictions being lifted has been based off of people that have their first vaccine, which for me is a little bit suspect because this isn't the entire point to get people fully vaccinated. But if that's what their science and data is saying, then I guess that we're going to go with it. Well, uh, again, where is that? But uh, yeah. I was surprised she didn't uh, have a big press conference yesterday. That was my surprise too. I mean, this is pretty big news, right? This is she the released kind of it in an email. good PR stuff that you want to have. But it's okay. It's all right. You know, we're not running her PR team. I, I we do a good job. You know, I'm such a cynic. Though I'm always like, hmm. Must be something else going on. Uh, the $300 federal unemployment bonus going to residents who lost work during the COVID-19 pandemic 
would be eliminated under a bill passed Thursday by the Michigan House. Republicans insist the measure would help small businesses bolster hiring amid uh, the crippling labor shortage. Things are really bad for uh, yeah. business owners out there right now. Uh, during debate on the House floor Thursday afternoon, Republicans argued that House Bill 4434 would usher in a true return to normalcy as the state prepares to abandon most of its pandemic-related restrictions next week. Now, Republicans argued that the residents who are collecting unemployment benefits are hurting small businesses, some of which have been decimated by the economic fallout of the pandemic. Democrats, though, scolded their colleagues' effort to stop using the federal funding for the supplemental benefits, saying doing so would deny Michiganders their own tax dollars. Uh, Whitmer, who has spoken in favor of continuing the use of federal funding to boost the state's economy recovery, uh, likely will veto the bill. It goes to the Senate next, which, again, it's expected to pass, but uh, the governor will probably veto it. Right, with both chambers of the uh, Congress at the state level being re being led by the Republican Party, it is very likely that this, this bill will pass. No surprise the governor would then veto this bill, as it is something that goes very much against her administration's beliefs and her party's beliefs on this particular issue. In terms of eliminating this, the business community would, of course, I, I would think be very welcome to that, as they do, they have, in many cases, blamed this benefit as being the reason for their struggles with getting people to go back to the workplace. And in some cases, that is a valid argument. Uh, the question is whether or not this would really provide that push and that incentive to go back to work for a lot of these workers, a lot of which have argued that the reason isn't for the benefit, it's because of the, the pay situation and being a, able to make a living wage. Both of those arguments, both from the business side and from the employee side, valid arguments. And it's going to continue to be an argument whether or not this benefit, these $300, are still in play. Um, some states, though, have already um, done away with it. Yeah. Because you can opt in yeah. or opt out. Right. And uh, several states have already opted out. I believe Ohio is one of them. Yeah, I believe Ohio, I know for sure that Florida is, and I believe Texas is also another one that has opted out. Uh, Fourth of July, just mm -hmm. around the corner, but get ready, there could be a shortage of fireworks. Uh -oh. Another possible shortage might mean the sky isn't as bright this Independence Day. Weeks ahead of the July 4th festivities, Phantom Fireworks, the nation's largest consumer-based retail fireworks company, is urging customers to shop early as the industry faces a potential shortage for the second year in a row because uh, sales of fireworks boomed last year, 2020, as more families opted to put on their own shows amid the COVID-19 pandemic after cities across the nation canceled their public displays. So this year, the Ohio-based fireworks company, which has about 80 stores throughout the U.S. and supplies thousands of retailers nationwide, says it has extended store hours and brought in additional staff to try to sell their backyard firecrackers. But like many other industries, the fireworks industry has also experienced delays due to shipment challenges facing the global market. So um, keep that in mind if you're going to be out uh, getting your fireworks because, uh, you know, when I worked for ATF, we would have to go do inspections mm -hmm. with some of these companies and how they store their fireworks right. and this, that, and the other. So I learned a lot about the industry. Almost all fireworks are made in China. Yeah, and having this shortage maybe hopefully will end up being a safer 4th of July weekend here in the local area as the availability of these general fireworks that you see and a lot of these fireworks shows that are organized may not be more readily available and some of those smaller fireworks that still are dangerous and still are very much <clears throat> in a situation where you need to be handling them correctly and safely and keeping in mind your neighbors and other people around you, those may be a little more commonly available but even when they are be kind of sparse. So maybe that will lead to, like we talked about yesterday with John Fitzgerald, less availability, less people using this, maybe less of a situation where we have those emergencies that come up during this holiday with people not quite being responsible with their fireworks. But that, that's to be seen because there may be a shortage, but that's not going to stop people from getting fireworks because much like the chief said yesterday, there's always the situations where people are getting it from the friend of a friend's cousin who knows someone who's a guy on <clears> the <throat> side of the street behind the Piggly Wiggly selling them.
you know. <laughs> the Piggly Wiggly. Yeah. I haven't heard that since I uh, lived in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> but uh, I will say we're already hearing them, you know, around here. Oh, yeah. It's like from, I don't know, the beginning of June until the end of July. They're going off all the time uh, here in the lake area. So... Obviously, the people around here, maybe they still had some left over from last year. Who knows? Yeah, but um, just keep that in mind if you're going to be out buying your um, fireworks. It, there is such a shortage of so many things right now, bikes and kayaks and boats. Uh, yeah. I was talking to a guy uh, last weekend who worked at one of the marinas, and he was saying, like, they've been crazy the last you know, starting last year and of course this year too because everyone bought the boats last year so now they're putting them in the water right now but there's a shortage of boats lumber prices are crazy gas mm-hmm. prices are crazy but yet we're coming out of the pandemic but we are still feeling the impact of the pandemic yeah the demand is there people want to get these projects done people want to uh, in the case of the lumber market and building and building houses and all their structures and recreationally people want to get back out there have some fun with their friends and their family and so they're going to buy boats and, and buy other vehicles and that's also causing there to be a lot of demand and a lot and still a relatively limited supply which of course affects everybody down the line especially when you're trying to make new materials as well which require those raw materials that are also in short supply i've been trying to find a kayak and a paddleboard mm-hmm. and uh, I'm too cheap to buy them new so I want you know to get a used one because we know yeah. you know They're so fun. many people they'll get them they don't really use them so they end right. up selling them but I'm trying to get one big enough so I could put Trixie Dixie on it and oh uh, you know teach her to get out on the water um, but even online like trying to find a used one they're hard like if I see one and I, you know, contact the person, it's gone like that. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a very competitive market. These things are going right away. People see a good deal, they're jumping on it, and the people that are selling, like, I don't know if I'm gonna get a better offer than this, so go ahead, take it, get it, get it out of here. And you know, get, instead of having a really competitive market across a period of time, lightning quick. Just like that. And uh, with that, uh, just a reminder, you can always uh, see the latest headlines. Go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus then at the top of the page we also put direct links to uh, valuable resources for you to keep an eye on the uh, ever-changing trends with this pandemic so you'll find uh, links to the CDC as well as the state of Michigan and Oakland County with that it may be gloomy and gray outside which means it's a great time to be in t- inside watching the mega cast because on this friday we have a great lineup uh for you when we come back we'll be speaking with the executive director share detroit uh first time i'm hearing about this so uh, looking forward to that and uh, also in the 10 o'clock hour we will be checking in with the executive director for meadowbrook hall how are things going over there if they're reopened and what you can expect this summer season that's all next here in the 10 o'clock hour of the megacast motorcyclists are hard to see to keep everyone safer it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? 
Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl in the studios alongside the one, the only, Mr. Tyler Keefe. Always great having you with us. Uh, as a reminder, we are here live Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. You can always find us Civic Center TV, Birmingham area, Municipal Access, uh, Channel 15 on Comcast. If you have cable, 99 on AT&T. And then uh, you can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. This has been um, quite the year for uh, so many businesses, but especially our nonprofits as well, because for so many nonprofits, they really rely on some of their big fundraising events to help bolster their bottom line. And uh, they haven't been able to do a lot of those fundraising events over the past year. But uh, there is a new organization that is starting uh, Share Detroit, which is focused on trying to help some of these nonprofits uh, to explain so much more. Let's bring in Jeanette Phillips. She's the executive director. Great to have you with us, Jeanette. How are you today? Hi, Ronnie. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about Share Detroit. Tell us more about Share Detroit. So Share Detroit is a website platform that um, aggregates, right now we have 180 nonprofits from Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County in one place to allow the community to go in and um, investigate, look around, um, and decide how they want to do good. Whether that means making donations, volunteering, a lot of the nonprofits have Amazon wish lists, so you could just buy items that they need and they'll ship directly to the nonprofit. And of course, everyone has events. Events are slowly coming back to your point a minute ago. Uh, we don't have quite as many events on the site yet, but <clears throat> we're hopeful that that will start to turn around. This really is brilliant because I know there are so many nonprofits. It could be hard to try to figure out one that could fit into your own personal, you know, life and which ones you want to donate or help. Uh, so how do you pick and choose which ones get on this platform? Okay, so we do not pick. We, our goal is to have every nonprofit in the Tri-County area on Share Detroit. And as an example, we're new, we're just ramping up and we're thrilled we already have 180. And in a second, hopefully I can share my screen and show you a little bit about it. But um, in Omaha, Nebraska and um, Charlotte, North Carolina are the kind of the two main cities that created this uh, portal, this platform. Share Detroit is one of the larger, most recent um, cities to come on. But in Omaha, which, you know, I'm from Detroit, right? So I think of Omaha as a small area. They have over 600 nonprofits on their portal. Wow. So for me, I'm like, okay, we should be able to get to 500 within six months and maybe over a thousand um, quickly. I, we, there's so many nonprofits in this area that do so much good and people can't see them because unless you've heard about it from someone else or word of mouth, or maybe it's down the street, you have no idea. So what's so fantastic about Share Detroit is we're aggregating everything in one place rather than quote unquote Googling. I want a tutor. I want a tutor near my home. And you just Google tutoring, you know, adult tutoring. It's complicated. It, you don't, it's hit or miss. So here all the nonprofits are coming together to us to become visible, you know, large and small. So with that, Jeanette, who is the driving force behind this? In Michigan, um, we have, I call him an angel investor, but Paul Velasic, who is a part of the Velasic family, um, 
re heard about this from Cher Charlotte and just really um, got it, you know, and, and got involved in the, the messaging and the mission of it. We're also a 501c3. So Cher Detroit is a nonprofit in its own right. Um, but Paul loved it and wanted to bring it to Detroit. So he, he and another man named Sam Rosenberg, um, their college buddies, um, together they got this going, negotiated and worked with Charlotte in Omaha to make a Detroit portal. And then I came on in January. Um, there are like five of us. We're all a little bit part-time, one full-time woman, but um, we're bringing it together. We're bringing it out here to the public now. So it's just getting underway. Yes, yes. And so what's really great about coming here onto your um, show, Ronnie, is the nonprofits know we're here. Like we're getting great traction with nonprofits, but now we need the community. People that are watching this show, people that hear about the show can tell their friends and family. We need the community to go to the site, look around, think about what they might wanna to do to help, maybe make a small $20 donation to a nonprofit that, that speaks to them. Keep coming back, keep watching. Um, the whole idea here is to bring traffic to the nonprofit. So this community, this ability, your platform, to get to the community is really important to us right now. And with that, Jeanette, um, when it comes to the nonprofits, do you and your team do any type of vetting with some of these nonprofits? We know some are better than others. Well, we try, we, we our, our, here's our little rules. They have to be a 501c3. They have to have a website. They have to have been in business for at least a year. Um, we have to have, we have four pillars on, um, four pillars on Share Detroit, volunteering, donating, the Amazon wish list, and events. So they have to have at least one pillar, you know, one pillar for people to, to visit. Um, and beyond that, we, we really try to be neutral, try not to, you know, there, the world is complicated now. And so there may be, multiple nonprofits on different sides of an issue. That's, we're here to be kind of Switzerland, bring them all together. The one thing I will say though, is we do not put churches, schools, and um, clubs on the website. E even if they are 501s or threes, typically they're not the C3, but um, they have their own base of following, you know, people. So we're wrestling a little with with a school foundation, you know, because it's a little different. Um, we haven't quite settled that yet, but but our goal is, you know, like nonprofits that are out in the world doing good. Uh, and there are so many, um, especially in, you know, I think throughout the pandemic too, the need was so great for right. so many of these nonprofits, but at the same time, they were having a hard time because they weren't getting the donations that they used to get. So this really is such a great time to bring all of this together. But what's it been like for you and your team because you're trying to do this in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, so we all, you can tell by my background here, we all work from home. Um, and it, it, you know, what's funny is it, it um, Paul Vlasic and, and the team, Sam and Paul and a woman named Carly was the original employee, were trying to gain traction on this before COVID. Like they were starting to ramp up and get organized to pull nonprofits together. And then COVID hit and, you know, it disrupted every one of us. So things slowed down. It was still obviously top of mind for all of them, but um, finally, it was, you know, people are used to the new normal in COVID. They're like, okay, we've got to get this going again. So what was great for, in my view, in January, the nonprofits were like eager to get into a centralized location to be visible because they had just gone through 10 or not nine or 10 months of COVID. And like you said, how do they find um, support? That sort of thing. So. Um, it was, you know, it was weird timing, but good timing in that we could get get ramped up um, quietly and um, and now it's ready to go. So do you mind if I show you the page for a quick minute? No, not at all. Okay, let me just, um, I'm gonna share my screen. Right now we have 
180 nonprofits. So when you go to sharedetroit.org, um, you this is the homepage. You can find nonprofits, you can volunteer or shop for good. And then towards the bottom are some of the events that are kind of timely. And I'll just point this out for anyone who says, oh, I wonder if my favorite nonprofit is on the site. And if they're not on the site, this is where they go. Are you a nonprofit? Apply, boom, and we will help them. But it's pretty straightforward. So, so if you go to find nonprofits, these are randomized. So every six hours or so, the, um, the nonprofits that pop on the first page will we'll change because we're trying to, like the Autism Alliance is a big one that people have heard of, I'm sure. Metro Detroit Share may not be, but we randomize this to uh, make sure everyone gets a chance. And you can see these pillars here um, are listed. So in the case of Pajama Program, which is in Farmington Hills, if you wanted to volunteer, you would, I'm gonna click here. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. Can, did I move? Did you move with me? Yep, yep, you're good. So it just talks a little bit about the pajama program, what they do, and um, they they don't have a wish list, so it says that, but what they need is conduct a drive or lead a fundraiser. So um, this is kind of the way this works. Um, and then I'll just say, I'm gonna go back to the homepage for a second. We're gonna find nonprofits. There, and over here are filters. So if they want to help seniors in education, we just click on seniors here. And these are all of the nonprofits who have said they help seniors. They self-select. So you can see here, it tells you which um, categories they support. Um, Forgotten Harvest, here we are. Friendship House, One Girl Revolution. This is one that maybe is smaller, no one's heard of, but there's so many nonprofits that do such fantastic work. Um, and, the, and the web, what I love about it is the website is so clean and straightforward. So let's, I'm just gonna show you one more thing and I'll stop sharing. But I clicked on the Senior Alliance box and it goes to the same page we just saw for Pajama Program. And they have two volunteer opportunities and they, you know, don't have any events coming up at this time, but if they had events, they would be shown here as well. So it's so simple. And, um, you know, again, shop for good. These are the Amazon wish lists. So the everybody you'll see here, 93 nonprofits need things that you can just order from Amazon. And if you click the link, you'll go out to the Amazon um, website and say, oh, I wanna buy markers for life builders. Okay, great, let's go. So it's just easy um clean and again so important to help these 180 i'm going to stop sharing now 180 nonprofits and we have like 60 more in the bubble that are in the process of applying right so every week we're adding them but as i said earlier we need the community now to come and look around and learn and help do I'm good. I'm sending it right now to my uh, twin sister. She's the co-founder of the Sweet Dreams Project. They oh. do uh, fantasy bedrooms for kids that are uh, chronically or terminally ill. With that, though, when we're looking at the events, mm -hmm. how do you keep up to date with the events? Is it up to the nonprofit to go in and add events and take it out? Yes. So we, uh, part of our <clears throat> little team here is to excuse me, keep up with them and tell them that they need to keep their page fresh, add volunteer opportunities, add events. Think about, um, we have a woman on the team now who's focused on group events. So we can engage with churches or corporate um, community group, community groups, corporate people to do larger um, volunteer events. So each nonprofit has control over their page. They, they really, the onus is on them to keep it, keep it current. Don't just set it up and walk away. We, you know, we're, our job is to try to build the community base to come visit. Their job is to make sure that their page is, is timely, right? So people do get inspired and do get engaged. You know, add photos, add events, talk about your volunteer needs. 
And so hopefully people will also donate. It, it, absolutely. It, you know, especially um, as we come out of the pandemic and life starts to get back to normal and some of these nonprofits, you know, a lot of them still aren't doing in-person big events. Right. Because, you know, they take months and months to plan. So they didn't know what was going to be happening right now. So, uh, you know, they've canceled a lot of them. And so uh, donations are so deserved, but also, um, you know, volunteers. The, there are so many ways that you can help. And uh, this is such a good program. Hey, Jeanette, how did you get involved in this? So um, before. The job before this job, I worked for a nonprofit in Detroit called Mercy Education Project. And we help women and girls, um, women get their GEDs and tutor girls in the Detroit public schools. So I connected with Carly Moore, um, our full-time staffer, to join the Share Detroit platform a year, year and a half ago. And we struck up kind of a, a nice, you know, professional friendship and I would give her my thoughts, my advice. You know, I've been around in nonprofits for a long time and Carly was new and young. So um, she reached out to me. I, it, I left uh, MEP in October. So it was just kind of serendipity that we kept talking. She was looking for me to, they're ready to start adding these nonprofits and I wasn't at MEP and nicely they let her know. Here's Jeanette's personal email and um, and she, they're like, you're available. Talk to me, you know. So, so it worked out great for me. I love it. I love supporting this. Yeah, see we're how helping that, everyone. Yeah, and that timing that comes together, right? To, you know, right. so it's perfect timing. With that, uh, Jeanette, too. Are you just surprised when you see all these nonprofits? And a lot of them started uh, just with one, two, three people when they recognized a need. Right, exactly. And we, there's a there's a nonprofit. I'll do a quick story. There's one. It's in Northville, Living and Learning Enrichment Center. And the founder is a woman whose son uh, has autism, and she was like, she could see that he was, you know, not getting the socialization with other kids and all kinds of things as he was growing up. And then in middle school and high school, it just like everything stops. So she formed Living and Learning enrichment center to answer the need of teens and young adults for socialization, vocational job training, um, bringing them together in friendship. So that started with one woman in a library in Farmington Hills, the Farmington Public Library. She was a teacher. Um, she, she dropped everything, focused on living and learning, and now is um, helping hundreds and hundreds of people with autism and with disabilities too, um, out in Northville, Eight Mile and Griswold. So um, yeah, it happens and, and it, you know, it percolates up and we're, our hope at Share Detroit is to allow the community to see more people like Rochelle and allow other nonprofits to grow and, and really expand. Because it can be really hard for some of these smaller nonprofits because they don't have a big budget to hire a PR firm or to do uh, some of that, you know, social media networking as well. Because uh, some of these nonprofits, too, you know, the people that are involved also are working maybe full time or, you know, taking care of their family. So it can be a challenge. This is a great way to get your message out. Yeah, exactly. And the volunteer, you'll see in the volunteer opportunities, if you look again, or I hope everybody listening looks again, but they have requests, social media help, photography, videography, you know, it can be things you can kind of do remote rather than going in and packing food boxes, right? There's all the gamut of, of volunteer opportunities and they do need the help. They definitely do, the small ones especially. So with that, Jeanette, uh, can it be hard some days, though, to talk to, you know, some of the founders or workers from these nonprofits? Because some of them, you know, get started out of heartbreaking situations. Oh, yes. Y yes. Yes. And so there's an, one example. It's called Kevin Song. And so the founders are uh, parents, husband and wife, whose son committed suicide. And... Um, she, they are, that's out in Gross Point, but <clears throat> they're focused on trying to help other families 
not go through that, how to recognize warning signs, how to bring people together. Um, <clears throat> so even though it's, you know, it's heartbreaking to hear sometimes these founding stories, they are doing such great work. And it's so important for, you know, pe some people need the support, right? So also on the nonprofits, I'm so focused on how we can help the nonprofits, but all the nonprofits are there to help us. Their goal is to help different aspects of the community. So Kevin Song is there to help people who may be going through that or worried that their child or uh, husband or wife is thinking things like that. So it's, you know, it's a it's another way to help the community, you know, see what's out there, what resources are available. And uh, I'm glad you asked that question because that's important too, right? Yeah, it People really is. It. Yeah. And, you know, we see that, uh, I know there is a, a lady in Detroit whose son was murdered and she started a group, um, Mothers of Murdered Children, and for them, it's, they lean on one another. Like, right. you know, for her, it's part of her healing process, but for other mothers that are going through it, it really is that resource of bringing everyone together so that we can heal as one community as well. And sadly, it's through heartbreak so many times. Jeanette Phillips with us again, Executive Director for Share Detroit. Jeanette, just a, uh, another minute or two uh, before we say goodbye. Anything else maybe I didn't ask that you um, want to add? Um, I, I really, I want to just say out loud again that we need the community to come to Share Detroit take some time you know and when i say that i mean five minutes just stro scroll through take a look see what's there how you might be able to help um i know detroit is a beautiful city this metro area because we all want to help and we all understand we have to do the work it, it doesn't happen by other people we don't have that kind of a community we know we have to dig in and get it done so our, what we're trying to do at Share Detroit is get it done by bringing it together and, um, and then allowing the community to help. And again, um, some person in the community may find a resource that they never knew existed, which also could be, you know, is beautiful. So spread the word is all, I'm, that's my hope now, is I need everyone to understand Share De oh, ShareDetroit.org. Let me go check, you know, that kind of thing. Well, we wish you um, the best of luck and continued success with this. It's a great platform to try to get all these nonprofits the help that they need. But also, you know, coming out of COVID, Tyler, too, so many people, we've been depressed. You know, people are suffering from mental health. Yeah issues this is a good way to get back involved and get engaged in your community because when you're feeling isolated and alone when you go volunteer and help your troubles don't seem so big you know so every this is a win-win Jeanette exactly thank you so thank, much well thank you again for your time share Detroit if you want to uh, find out more we'll take a quick break here on the megacast when we come back we'll be headed out to a Meadowbrook Hall that's next here on the megacast can I ask you a question why did you get your kids vaccinated it was hard for them to social distance to be isolated from their friends want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. 
If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the Organ Donor Registry. Welcome back to the Megacast. Uh, as a quick reminder, uh, you can always catch previous episodes of the show. Just go to civiccentertv.com, click on Megacast, or the on-demand section if you uh, just want to catch an individual interview. You know, we've had uh, Meadowbrook on a few times throughout the yes. pandemic. It is such an incredible place uh, to visit. Um, have you been there before? I have, yes, it is an incredible place, yes. Uh, you know, and I know that I've been to a few events there as well, but uh, a lot of things had to be closed down at the hall over the past year or limited, but uh, fingers crossed things are getting back to normal at Meadowbrook. Uh, to talk a little bit more, let's bring in William Matt. He's the new executive director. Great to have you with us. Thank you, glad to be here. Nothing like changing jobs in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, you know, I have a little bit of a commute, so actually working remotely still occasionally is, is, is kind of helpful, so it's, it hasn't been too bad. Well, that's good to know as well. I will say, um, on days like today, too, when it's rainy and dreary, it's nice working remotely, isn't it? I'm at the office today, so I had to drive through the rain, but... Oh. Uh, no. You know, uh, it seems like it rains every time I come or go, but you know, I make the best of it, so it's not too bad. And I, I certainly enjoy coming in here. Uh, so uh, with that, um, do you go by William or Bill? Bill. Okay, Bill. Uh, so I, I notice on your profile it's William, Bill. So, uh, Bill, so um, how are things at the hall? Are they back open now, or are you doing limited visitation? We are open. We are um, open for tours um, Friday through Mondays. And so that's, I think, uh, like one day um, shorter of a schedule than typical. Um, but we are um, doing uh, our wedding receptions and wedding ceremonies. Um, there's a small capacity limit probably till July 1. But um, we started in, in early May and we we're hosting about three weddings a week. Um, so business is back. It's just a little bit more cautious in how we approach it. So uh, are you trying to play catch up on some of these weddings that were maybe postponed from last year? Well, we like to think that, you know, our numbers are up because we're so great, <laughs> but there is some residual effect from previous years. So, uh, you know, some, some were postponed or rescheduled from last year and, um, you know, they, we have them back on the calendar this year, but our numbers are, you know, higher than 2019, which is kind of our last um, regular year. So that's good to know. Um, I'm thinking about some of these uh, poor brides planning these weddings and then the capacity limits, they were constantly changing. And when you're planning a wedding, well, you kind of need a head count. And Helpful. so, okay. you know, I could imagine like you have 250 and then no, we can only have 50. Who, who gets eliminated from that list? So probably just easier to postpone, right? 
Yeah, I think in a lot of cases it was, uh, you know, because you don't want to exclude people, you don't want your ceremony to be less special because you, you have to cut down to, you know, a quarter of your um, anticipated guest list. But um, everybody was scrambling. And so we really appreciate, you know, the, the, the clients that had things booked and working with us and being flexible because, you know, there wasn't really a lot that we could do either. You know, the entire state was going through this and, um, you know, we, we try to accommodate the best we can but appreciate, you know, their flexibility as well. We know people are looking forward to getting back outdoors and back to enjoying life that we used to know it's going into the summer. Any events coming up that people should know about? Uh, yeah, actually next week our summer concert series kicks off. Um, and so we have, um, that will be going on monthly um, for, you know, all the way into October, I believe. and. Uh, like I mentioned before, our touring is open, and so those are, are available for everybody to come in and, and experience. And you have to pardon me, because I'm since I am brand new, I'll have to refer to some notes. I don't know this as well as, as Jeff did. Um, and no, Shannon, it's it's perfectly okay. We're we're okay with that. Also, um, I'm told to, to mention yoga in the garden, but I, I will say that our gardens are looking fantastic because we had uh, what they call planting day. Um, maybe two weeks ago. And we have an incredible volunteer group that, that comes in every week, very dedicated and self-organized. There's huge numbers of people. And in planting day, they probably planted a thousand or, or more plants and flowers all over the grounds, um, just in time for kind of a spring rebloom. And so the grounds are looking amazing and it's, it's really beautiful right now. What's been the funnest thing about uh, this job for you since you've uh, joined the team? Um, you know, the, the funnest thing for me is um, the hall itself, you know, kind of exploring different areas of it. You know, I was here um, at least two weeks and I was still discovering new hallways and new rooms and kind of wandering around and, and finding these features that are kind of built in, sometimes hidden. And so, you know, you really don't get to see those on a typical tour. You have to do the behind the scenes tour you know, for some of these things, but you know, there's in the secret stairways and there's the ladder up to the playroom and passages and windows and things, um, you know, going out on the balcony uh, to overlook the property, um, you know, from the fourth floor or from the flagpole. So, you know, really um, getting to um, poke around and like open up closets and, you know, uh, every, everywhere you go, there's something amazing, every room. Bill Matt with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the executive director over at Meadowbrook uh, Hall. And with that, uh, Bill, you had me at that one word, secret stairway. Are there really secret passages uh, in the house? There are, yeah. There's, there's probably, you know, four I can think of right offhand. You what? Know. So from the library, there's a secret staircase and it's, and a lot of the, the design was built in with the paneling. And so it's a door, like a bookcase, you know, uh, but it's it's actually a door, not a panel. And so if you open it, there may be filing cabinets in there, or in some cases there's there's stairs, for instance, into a magazine room off of the library. Um, each of the children's bedrooms um, have a, a staircase or a ladder that takes them up, upstairs above their room to a playroom. And of course, then there's the, the most famous one that goes from uh, the game room in the, in the lowest level up to Alfred's um, study and then to Alfred's bedroom. And so he had a direct route up and down that staircase um, to his you know, favorite spots of the house. That is so cool. And you know, for those that, uh, I'm sorry, we probably should have started off with this, but for those not familiar with the house, give us the history. Uh, you know, that's that's actually my favorite part about the, you know, it's not the, not the funnest, but it's most interesting to me is that the history of the house, um, and not just the house really, but the, um, you know, the founder, uh, Matilda Dodge Wilson, really, her story is just amazing. And so the history, you know, I like to think that Meadowbrook didn't begin um, in 1924, you know, when it was built. And so, so I'm going to be looking back into previous times, you know, who inhabited Southeast Michigan? Why is the, the geographical land so special here with the rolling hills and the water sources? And it looks like, you know, such a pastoral fields and things like that. Um, you know, what what led to the, the development before Meadowbrook Farms? But Meadowbrook Farms was um, a property purchased by uh, John Dodge of Dodge 
motor car company and its wife, Matilda. And um, after John Dodge passed away, Matilda remarried Alfred Wilson, and then they began construction of Meadowbrook Hall on the farm. So the farm was 1,400 acres, right? Um, wow. so it's a massive space. And um, they went, they traveled all over the world on their honeymoon and, and elsewhere, looking at a lot, a lot of European and English Tudor, hence the Tudor revival um, architecture that's pretty strong here in the building. And so they got all kinds of design plans and sketchbooks and note, notebooks and things like that. So one of our strongest features really is our collection of, of uh, works on paper, which are these these designs, these blueprints, these drawings. It's just uh, an amazing collection because they, they were so prolific in their research. So Matilda and uh, Alfred built the, built the home. It took a few years. And then the Roaring Trunk, you know, the, the, the Great Depression hit right about that time. And, uh, and it wasn't used like it was intended, but it was used, you know, uh, for the family. And, you know, beyond the home itself, you know, when Mat Matilda's greatest legacy really was, you know, uh, she gifted the entire property, the entire estate, Meadowbrook Estate, uh, including the hall, to then MSU Oakland to form it. It was the creation of Oakland University. And so, you know, what a, what a tremendous legacy to leave behind where you have 20,000 students every year that uh, graduate, you know, um, attend Oakland University, and you have generations of people that were able to benefit from education. It goes to her kind of root, um, you know, as a kind of a working class, blue collar, um, educated woman in the 20s. If you can imagine the glass ceiling that she must have faced. And I like to think of her, her relationship with the Dodge brothers, because people say that she was, you know, the Dodge brothers secretary. But at the time, you know, when you're creating a motor car company, an empire like that, um, I would say that she was a, a co-equal partner in that relationship with those those two brothers, because while they're inventing and they're, you know, selling and marketing all of their products and things like that, somebody's running the business, and that was Matilda. Wow, what a fascinating woman. And uh, like you said, such a legacy that she leaves behind uh, as well. Again, we're talking with Bill May. He's the uh, executive director over at Meadowbrook Hall. And with that, um, if we can ask, I know that, uh, you know, you have the summer concert series. There's so many other things that are going on over at Meadowbrook. How is it working? Do people still need to get tickets online? Is capacity limited right now, or will you get back to normal starting next week? So we expect to be entirely back to normal next week, but currently, you know, we, I think a lot of cultural institutions and from all my peers and colleagues I've spoken to, you know, um, we had to quickly develop some online capacity that we really didn't have before, but it actually kind of dragged us into the future, right? So now we were, you know, able to offer tours via app or mobile tours or online tickets, for instance, that maybe we hadn't done before. And so that's a feature that, I mean, really, in today's day and age, you, you kind of come to expect it, right? Um, and so we will continue to offer all of our tickets and, um, you know, for events and tours um, to be purchased online. Um, we will stagger that if there's a need to, so that we can only, you know, allow it, you know, maybe 15 or 20 people at a time or something like that with, with that particular time slot. And our wedding capacities, really it's, um, right now it should only impact like about another week's worth of weddings, but they're, they're still at 50% capacity only due to the fact that if they did need to come inside for a kind of weather shelter situation, we wouldn't have to leave anybody behind. And so, um, had, you know, we're thankfully through the, the most limited or restricted part of COVID. And um, so people coming to the house, of course, if you're, um, you don't have to wear a mask if you, if, if you have had your vaccination. And um, it's, it's, it's very much like uh, most other businesses that's reopening with a flourish. Well, we are so excited that it is reopening, especially uh, in the summertime as well, because it's a great time, like you said, Bill, to go visit the hall because the grounds themselves are worth going and exploring as well. Where can people get more information? Uh, Meadowbrookhall.org. And also, of course, you can follow us on all the social media outlets, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and our phone number, if anybody wants to actually talk to somebody, is 248-364-6200. The old school way. That's Picking right. up the phone, right? 
still need that. <laughs> well, Bill, we so appreciate uh, your time today, and we wish you uh, best of luck in the new position as well. Thank you. I look forward to meet, meeting you at some point and welcome everybody out to Meadowbrook and have a wonderful you know, weekend. Father's Day weekend is coming up and hope everybody has a great time uh, enjoying the space. Most definitely. Uh, again, Meadowbrook Hall getting reopened again this year. So different than uh, this time last year, Tyler. Yeah, a lot different seeing these places that are commonly visited by a lot of people from in our local area and attracts people from outside of the local area as well to come visit and, and explore some of the great history and the great landscapes and all the activities that we have here in Oakland County and in southeastern Michigan. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. We'll take a break here on the Megacast. When we come back in the 11 o'clock hour, we have a lot to talk about, and including, you know, what's it like for some of our superintendents right now? Because we know budgets are still kind of an issue for them. So we'll be speaking with the executive director for the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators next here on the Megacast. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again, it could save a life. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be with us uh, here on the Megacast as we all start to imagine life back the way it used to be. It's still uh, a challenge for uh, so many of our educators because we have to remember, you know, uh, students, you know, the young kids still can't be vaccinated. So as we emerge from the pandemic, it's still a challenge for uh, some of our school leaders to try to figure out this next phase. Um, to talk a little bit more, let's bring it back to Dr. Tina Kerr, Kerr, rather. So when I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, or was it Charleston, they had uh, Kerr, K-E-R-R, but it was pronounced care. Oh, interesting. It's like us with Shaner. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you always know who's not a local and this, that, and the right. other. So okay. every time I see that, it's just automatic. Okay. Uh, anyway, it was, it was great to bring in the doctor. She is uh, with the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. Great to have you with us again. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're a few months uh, now into this job. It's like an old hat, right? <laughs> I'll hit my one year mark July 1st. <laughs> wow. What a year it's been for you. Yes, absolutely. For everyone, for sure. So with that, as we, you know, start to what we hope to be the end of the pandemic. You know, we're loosening so many of the restrictions starting next week, earlier than anticipated. However, still looking for guidance on what this is gonna mean for the schools. Can you give us a little insight on what is going on behind the scenes and how you and uh, the superintendents are still trying to navigate this world? Well, I think you probably heard a huge sigh of relief across the state as schools finally started to come to an end for this school year. Um, it has been um, a tremendously challenging uh, year for educators across the state. But unfortunately, that sigh of relief is, is short-lived because as we ramp up into summer and start to think about next fall, all the planning has already been starting in March has to continue and, and move forward. The unknown is still there. I mean, the virus isn't gone, and now we have variants that um, are concerning for our districts. We know that there's going to be some more guidance coming out in regards to schools for reopening in the fall as, re as far as face masks, how we're going to continue to see the vaccinations proceed. But 
um, there's still a lot of unknown factors there. So schools are just trying to be as creative and um, as supportive of their families and communities and students to ensure that we have a great start uh, next fall. For the most part, is the thought though, when it comes fall, it's going to be back to normal? Our normal changed. Um, <laughs> well, <we> are, schools <laughs> may never get back sure. to the schools way they used to be. Schools will never be back to the way they, they, were, they were. I can tell you a majority of uh, districts are having conversations because some students have been extremely successful online. And I think schools are gonna find themselves having to set schedules that may have two or three different schedules, a hybrid, an in-person, or strictly online. And that is a lot of work and, and, and can be very challenging for districts, especially when you think about the number of staff and how we have to cover um, those offerings um, with the districts. But I will tell you this, all of our district leaders have really focused on, we can't go back the way we did education before. So even though it may not be um, students walk in the building September 1st, it's just like, this is how it is. It's the way it always was. That, those days are gone. Our superintendents are gonna continue and district leaders will continue to try and transform education in light of what just happened in this pandemic. Well, some people will argue that, you know, the education scene needed a shakeup because, you know, we were so used to this is the way it's done and it's hard sometimes to change the way things were done. So could this actually maybe be some good silver linings coming out of this? We've said that all along. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't think any educator in the state would ever say that the system was perfect. Um, we did have students that um, needed more supports. We needed a change and shift in our funding structures. We needed to um, move into this new technology era. And, it, and the pandemic forced us to do some things, but it also showed us that we're a resilient profession and we can change with the needs of our society and our students because the jobs that we used to train for 100 years ago, we're trying now to train for the jobs in the next 50 because they're completely different. That industrial era is, is no longer what we're training for. So the system had to change for sure. So with that, Dr. Tina Kerr with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the executive director for the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. And so, uh, Doctor, if I can ask you as well, you mentioned budgets, uh, the word funding. How is that going to change? And is it improved, do you anticipate? Well, obviously there's been a one time, I say that one time infusion of funds that doesn't fix our funding problems in Michigan. You know, this SFRC report is, is something that we fully support as an association, as well as the work you may have heard from with Launch Michigan. We have to have an adequate, equitable and sustainable funding structure moving forward for students. Not every child costs the same to educate. And the other issue is, is this pandemic showed us how, how we knew we had equity gaps, but they were exacerbated through this pandemic. And so I feel we are in crisis right now to really truly change the funding structure of Michigan schools because our students deserve that and have to have that um, in place so that we can continue to improve the services that are provided to them and help educate every child where they're at and where they're coming from. Well, I think, um, you know, coming out of this pandemic, one thing, so many parents have a much larger appreciation for our educators and all of the work that, uh, you know, the teachers and everyone on the front lines of the education system in the state of Michigan, you know, you're newly appreciated. But when we're talking about funding, how would you like to see it change? <laughs> I don't think we have time for this whole interview <laughs> to tell you all of how I'd like it changed. Um, the big thing is, is, is it, if you haven't, um, the SFRC report is, is very thorough and talks about how we have to, number one, cost of living, inflation, typically we have not covered for that. The biggest uh, issue for me is the special needs, ELL, and at-risk youth. The funding structure we have does not meet their needs. They definitely, we have to adjust 
and create a more equitable system. And then the other issue is, is in my perfect world, it shouldn't matter where your zip code is as to what you have access to. And unfortunately, across the state, depending on where you live and depending on what's available, your zip code does impact that. And that's because of the funding structure we have right now. I think all of our high school students should have access to a career in tech um, opportunity. Early college, I think our, our young students should, especially those that are special ed and ELL, should have the best services available so that they can make those gains. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that need to happen in the funding to ensure that it's equitable, fair, and adequate. Um, but uh, like I said, we could talk all day long about what that looks like in terms of dollars. And that's why um, we participate and are supportive of the work of launch because that's what we're doing is we're dissecting that and seeing what does it need to look like in Michigan thanks to the support and partnership with business and philanthropy as well. And, and you know, we know too, schools are struggling right now to get enough employees from teachers to bus drivers and everyone in between. What, how is that going to impact the education that our kids have if we can't start filling that gap? Um, it's going to have, a, we are in crisis right now as far as our educator shortage. You know, uh, during the pandemic, we saw uh, staff members that may have been, had medical issues that were able, have walked away from the profession just because they didn't want to risk their lives to um, be an educator. Um, but over time, we've started to see this shortage occur and then the pandemic hit and now it's grown even more. There are a lot of great things happening across the state and in fact, MDE, just kicked off their uh, new Welcome Back Michigan Proud campaign. And we are very supportive of that because there's, there's things in place with certifications and qualifications that you have to have. But we, I can remember being a principal and it was nothing for me to have 200 applicants for a second grade position. Now our districts are lucky if they have one, wow. one qualified. It is remarkable how big of a crisis we have on our hands with education. And part of it, you mentioned it earlier, and I appreciate you saying that parents are starting to appreciate their teachers, appreciate their educators, because now they're kind of seeing it firsthand of how challenging it can be. But education has really taken a lot of hits over the past few years. And why would people want to enter the profession? I mean, the public has, has been very, critical of, of educators. And so we're trying to build that back and we're trying to show that this is a great profession to be in and um, it's so rewarding. I mean, I knew since I was 10, I wanted to be a teacher. So um, I'm glad I, I made that choice for myself. I have some friends that have been uh, substitute teachers, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic as well. Some of them are retired or maybe are deciding that uh, their career isn't the right career. They may want to go into teaching. It's hard to stand in front of a classroom yep. of a bunch of fifth graders because they are smarter than we are. Yeah, for sure. And bless them for wanting to be a substitute. That's a whole nother area that we are having a tremendous shortage in. But you know, with, with programs like the Welcome Back Educators, the, the state and our association, we're all trying to find ways to make it easy for them to want to re-enter into the profession. Um, because again, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they couldn't get a teaching position. So they, they had to pick another career path or unfortunately, we ship so many of our quality educators out of state because they had to go somewhere else to find those jobs. So this is kind of our all call, all hands on deck. We need to get our educators back in the classroom. Because if we don't have teachers to fill the classrooms, that continues, uh, you know, the struggle to try to get our kids educated. And Absolutely. also, and so what if we're, Looking at the gap, we do know that, you know, in history of all industries, not just teaching, but when there is a shortage of qualified people, then there are people that make it through the cracks that maybe shouldn't be teachers. So is there concern in that arena as we go forward? Well, you know, we've said all along, and, and again, with all our stakeholder work that we do with MDE, is this is a, a premier profession. We're educating the citizens in our future as well. 
we're not going to lower our standards or lower our qualifications just to have a warm body in a classroom. That, that is not, not the goal here. The goal here is to find talented, qualified people that may be interested in coming back to the classroom or again for us we're trying to campaign to encourage people to enter the profession and that's going to start in middle school and high school so we've kind of got to build our own pipeline and then um, try and get those that have already been through an education program and then we've also reduced um, some of the barriers that might exist in regards to the student teaching experience and some of those other things to help expedite um, teachers wanting to get in the profession. But you're exactly right. We have to have educators in order to be successful for our students. And fun educators that make, you know, learning exciting uh, for the kids exactly. as well because they learn so differently today than, you know, back when we were kids. I mean, just think about all of the students this year, the fifth grade math, the old math, carry the one versus the new math. How many kids had to learn how to carry the one because mom and dad were like, I have no clue what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've seen enough of the memes on Common Core that um, I, I totally understand. And having been an educator and then being an administrator and going back and trying to help my own <laughs> child, I was like, uh, what's going on here? I need to do a little more investigating. So um, it is it is very challenging and we, we are, we're trying to create um, a new new group of leaders um, coming through our system so that they can be successful in the workplace that is ever evolving. And now with COVID, I mean, how many businesses have gone completely online? If you don't have those technical skills, you're not gonna be successful. So yeah, we, got, we have to have education be more flexible and um, have the ability to be more agile. And with that, um, when we're talking about the students, because we know that throughout the pandemic and over the past year, some students just got lost in the shuffle because we it was hard to you know do count days and things of that nature. Do you anticipate that we've lost some of our students uh, throughout this pandemic and maybe they're going to other schools or they're deciding now to go completely online? Yeah, we, we have a really good system of, of tracking our students. And I will tell you, um, you've read the stories probably of district leaders and teachers knocking, physically knocking door to door to, to find students. But there is concern that some of our students will, will not come back and you know, for us too, this, this pandemic has really um, heightened the need for us to continue our focus on social emotional learning. Um, part of why we lost students is, is maybe they didn't have the supports at home that they needed to, to get to school or to get online or have those resources. So um, we're gonna have to continue to address this. And I know um, districts have plans in place of how do we count every kid and get them back in the classroom. But unfortunately, we did we did see a, a huge um, shift with our students. And, and it's alarming because we need to know where they're at so that, that we can make sure they're safe and, of course, that they're learning. Do they still have uh, truancy officers? We sure do. <laughs> and actually, you probably heard the governor is putting together an, a social justice uh, commission. And that will be huge for us, too, because it's it, we, we do have to track um, where our students are and make sure they're safe. So throughout the pandemic, when we're talking about losing some of the students, because, you know, some parents decided to put their kids and, you know, Catholic schools or other schools that private schools that were open. And the concern there is even more of a divide between the haves and the have nots because they could afford it but other parents couldn't. So do you anticipate those kids are going to stay at those schools or maybe they come back? You know, it, it, each family's gonna have to make that decision. Um, I would imagine if a parent had a positive experience in one particular situation that they will probably keep their child there. We've already been disrupted so much. If they're, they're doing well, keep them where they're at and keep moving forward. And to be honest, that's what we all want for all our kids is we want them to be in an environment where they're successful. 
we saw across the state, one district's in uh, full remote and one's in full in-person. Kids, parents were moving their kids over to that district because they needed to go to work or whatever their case may be. So we may see a little bit of jumping back and forth, but I would anticipate it's not gonna be as great as what some people might think. Dr. Tina Kerr with us here on the Megacast, the Executive Director for the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. Uh, before we say goodbye to you today, anything else that you want to share or touch on that maybe I didn't ask? Well, it's just more of a plea to our communities and our families. Be patient. Um, our educators have worked extremely hard, but there's a lot of work to do. When you come back in September, if you don't see the change that you anticipated, be patient because it takes a lot of planning to get ready to do a hybrid or do a, a full remote in person. Districts have a lot of planning ahead of them. So I, I fully expect this recovery time to be three, four, five years before we get to where we really want to be in the end. So thank you for the support. And um, I, I'm very grateful that we have such resilient leaders across the state. I think they should take some of this uh, COVID money and all the educators and the members of the superintendents and teachers, you all need a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hello, right. go to Disney World. Exactly. <laughs> open they deserve it after great. this year <laughs> well we so appreciate your time as always and uh, of course all the work um because we know it hasn't been easy and you know there's no break this summer for you and your team but we appreciate oh. it yeah absolutely and thanks again for bringing awareness to our communities support our educators and that's everyone in the schools be nice to the bus drivers be nice to the janitors and the superintendents they've really been kind of the punching bags throughout mm -hmm. this pandemic and it's not been an easy time uh, with that uh, though we'll take a, a break here on the mega cast and when we come back um, I'm excited to talk to our uh, next guest. It's the owner of the Board and Brush over in Sylvan Lake. Uh, they opened up right before the pandemic. Uh, how are things going? We'll check in with them next here on the Megacast. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's the second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Mr. Tyler Keith. Tyler, our next guest, two of the best things in the world. Yes. Wine and paint. Not mixed together necessarily, but you know you can you can paint while drinking wine. Let's, let's just clarify that. Don't mix paint and wine. We all um, need to get out of our homes, get together with some of our friends, and uh, get creative to help us uh, reduce the stress from everything that we've been through over the past year. And there is uh, a great place to be able to do that, and that is Board and Brush. It's in Sylvan Lake. We're uh, excited to have the owner on, Dee Sloan, with us here on the Megacast. Thanks for uh, taking time to be with us. Thanks for having me, guys. So, uh, you know, because I know you're right there on Orchard Lake next to the car wash. So I'm always yeah. looking because it, were you closed for a good portion of the COVID? On and off. You know, when there were certain restrictions, we closed because it made sense. Um, there were times that were open with a much smaller capacity. So um, we did have two times where we were closed pretty, for a pretty substantial length of time. So with that, um, what's it been like for you as a, a business owner to try to manage uh, your business throughout this pandemic? I mean, it's definitely been um, incredibly challenging. Um, 
I'm a business owner and also a mom of two. So um, my youngest is in, was in preschool the whole time in person, but my daughter had the half days throughout the whole school year. So it was um, some of the time it was a blessing because I could focus on that part of my life. Um, but there's, you know, the other side of running the studio that um, became a challenge when um, we, you know, when we had to close or shut down or have the smaller groups. So um, definitely it had its set of challenges, but um, we're still here. You're still here because you guys opened up what not long before the pandemic, right? Yeah, like just shy of a year before the pandemic. So your new business opening up, it um, became very popular. Uh, you know, places such as yours. So um, with that, how is business going now? You know, we're it's month to month right now, it's still, um, it's kind of unpredictable. So we'll have a strong month and then we'll be followed up by a slower month. So um, it, that's correlated a lot to um, rises in COVID cases and then falls of that. And then we're now here in our summer months, which are at, um, typically our slower time of the year anyway. Um, you know, we're an indoor, facilities so people in the summers in michigan love to be outdoors so usually summers are our um, slower time of the year but then come september once um, kids are back in school and um, the weather starts to shift um, we that's when we start picking back up so i think that will be like the true test to see you know um, if we've rebounded from where we were in our first year um, so that would be you know year three for us at that point so, D, I'm looking at uh, like the flower box and the s'mores box right there with you. So super adorable. Do people have to be artistic? No, that's no, not at all. You can come in and there's, you can be the least artistic person. Um, you're guided step by step um, from one of, with one of our instructors. And um, we use stencils. So that's how you can get those nice clean lines and um, the design painted onto the boards. So um, all you have to do is um, come in ready to have fun and listen and you guys will be able to walk out with something like this see, see and then you could say tyler look what i made exactly i'm it, an artist it's yep. it's like you know art camp absolutely you know we get customers who um you know have come in and made multiple projects for their own home but they just love the experience of making something and they can always find a great excuse that, you know a teacher at the end of the school year a wedding shower or actual wedding um just different events in people's lives that we see customers coming back um, time and time again to create with us. And it really is uh, a good gift because it's, you know, you can make it personal. And so it will mean something more to the person receiving it other than just, you know, going to Home Goods or TJ Maxx. Absolutely. You know, that's what we say. Like, you know, these are homemade, they're made from the heart. So you um, give that extra personal touch. Uh, and then a lot of our projects have customizations with like last names and children's names, things like that. So um, we find it doesn't matter how old you are. If, if you um, still have a parent alive, they love homemade gifts from their kids just as much as somebody, you know, maybe in my stage of life who has a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And I, you know, cherish those gifts. So I, we find that some of the customers who make them for their parents then come back together because they've loved, you know, getting the gift from their child. and. Um, want to come experience it with them. Dee Sloan with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the owner of Board and Brush in Sylvan Lake on Orchard Lake Road. And with that, Dee, how does this work? Is it, uh, do you go in, do you pick the project or is it just a free for all? So we either have um, public or private events. So um, either way, all of our customers pre-register. So they would go onto our website. Um, it's still like they were booking a public event. They would go onto our website. They would select the day that they wanted to create with us, um, one of the days that we have a class in the studio. And then it's basically like online shopping from there. They would go on our gallery, pick out what projects they're going to make. They'd add it to their cart, add any of the personalizations that the project might require, and then they check out. So once they've checked out, they're, they've paid at that point. Their seat's reserved in the day of. They just show up. They can bring their beverages of choice and um, come create with us. We know so many businesses went virtual through the pandemic. Did you do anything via Zoom or online? Yeah, we did. We did. We had some. Um, we um, offered some Zoom classes. So it was um, mostly to private groups, and we would um, prep some of their materials in advance, and somebody from their group would come pick it up, and then we would Zoom with the rest of their group. So this would be a, an example of another type of thing that we did through the pandemic. This hope sign right here. Um, we had 
a huge gallery, probably 100 or 200 options of at-home kits. So they were ones that customers could um, order online and then pick up here, and they were um, smaller size projects that they could create at home. And with that, D, do you think that that's going to stick around, or are people just excited to get back in person? I think both. I think it opens up an opportunity for um, larger groups that we couldn't fit in a space like this, especially ones that you know might have reasons why they can't all gather at the same time um, or be at the same place at the same time. So, um, for instance, like a work group that um, maybe has um, members of their team scattered. That's an um, or we have like a, an elementary school that wanted to um, have a way for students to connect. So some were virtual, some were in person, and they did a Zoom um, and you know made a similar type of project like this uh, during that Zoom call, so the students could have a time to connect with each other. So that was a really fun um, fun experience. What made you want to open up this business? Are you creative um, to begin with? I am. I always have been creative and just love creating. I wouldn't say like I'm, a, I'm not an artist, so I didn't. I wasn't ever going to be, you know, Picasso or anything like that. But I've always um, been creative, so I just love working with my hands and um, starting a project, start to finish, and seeing, you know, what I've accomplished and what I've made. So, really wanted to share that, and you know, was in the corporate world for a long time and ready to do something completely different than that. So, um, and then here I am. So how's it been going? Are you happy you made the move? I am. I mean, I, lo I love it. It's, you know, owning your business comes with its own set of struggles and um, challenges, but um, I am definitely happy. I never walk in to work now and don't want to be here. I'm always enjoying my time, and um, I like creating with customers and seeing how excited they are to make something that um, some, of the, some of the administrative side of stuff um, you know, isn't my favorite, but any job we're going to do, we're going to have a set of things that we love to do and other things that are going to be things that we rather hand off to somebody else if we could. <laughs> isn't that the truth? Uh, Dee yeah. Sloan with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the owner for uh, Board and Brush in uh, Sylvan Lake. And so how does this typically work if you get like a group of girlfriends or a group of coworkers um, and then they pick a time or do you have set times yeah no we don't really have set times we're pretty flexible it's depending upon availability of staffing and, and group size and so usually customers will call with the date that they're looking for um we'll check to make sure that we have that time time and date available and from there we are able to usually um, host a variety of groups so um once we're back to full capacity um we can host groups up to right around 30 people um, we've been on you know smaller capacity and until this you know I think next week is when um, those capacity restrictions are lifted. As a business owner, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride trying to keep up with the restrictions and what to do here and what to do there. And yeah, <laughs> you need a mask, you don't need a mask. So how has right. that been for you in navigating this uh, world of restrictions? You know, it's it's been interesting. Um, most customers have been pretty compliant with the rules and regulations and respectful of that. We're, you know, we want to make everybody comfortable in our space. So um, it has, you know, there's been times where we can't make everybody happy, but we're gonna follow, you know, follow the rules that are put into place because um, that's what society expects of us right now. And we want to do the right thing. So um, it's been, there's been challenges with it, but I say overall, it's been, relatively smooth in that in that regard i've heard you know heard of other businesses large and small had a lot more you know challenging situations than i've been presented with during this so with that d i'm on the website wine paint and wood signs that's right up my alley tell us more about that <laughs> so yeah so our main medium we use is wood um so customers will um you know like, like i mentioned earlier select a project they want to make they're going to come in and no, no, you know, you're going to start with raw materials. None of this is going to be stained. It's not going to be sanded. You are going to come come in and do all the work while we guide you through the steps. So you're going to be really hands-on of sanding this and staining it and applying the stencils and painting and fin whatever finishing touches your project might um, include. And during that time, I mean, it doesn't have to be wine. It can be whatever your beverage, beverage of choice is. Some people will come in with their coffees. Other people will come in um, with their wine or beer or whatever beverage they might like. 
and um, just enjoy a night out, um, especially after the last year plus that we've all been through. Right. So go ahead and be honest. Have you seen some people leave and their stuff is just terrible? You're like, they weren't paying attention at all. Oh boy. <laughs> Very rarely. Those are the ones I use as examples as the what not to do. Um, <laughs> so in, in hopes that that doesn't happen again. So, um, you know, there's, there's been the, the, from time to time something that's come up, but we are usually able to help correct those things like in the moment or after the fact. If it's, you know, so that we want everyone to leave happy with the project that they've made. With that, D, um, we always ask so many of the business owners, what has there been a silver lining for you and your business through this pandemic? I would say the silver lining is that, we you know, that I ha had my own business during this. I don't know what it would have, the last year and a half would have looked like if I was still in the corporate world and trying to, you know, uh, be a mom during all of this as well. So it's given me that flexibility and that is something I'm super grateful for. Um, it is also, you know, it's allowed me to manage my own schedule through all of this and be available for when I needed to be for school or whatever it might be for, for my children during this. Um, and so I think that that's been like the huge silver lining. And then also I would, the, the support of like the community and friends and um, customers throughout this too. We've had some fantastic customers and neighborhood response to helping support us during this time. Yeah, and that comes with being in a small community like Sylvan Lake. Yeah, I, I could never imagine another community to live in. It's, there, it's a super supportive community. It's wonderful, very um, close knit. And that's another one of the groups that, you know, we did a, a big Zoom with a bunch of the neighborhood ladies um, during this. and have had support, you know, along the way from lots of people within our community. That's great to hear. Dee Sloan with us, the owner of Board and & Brush in Sylvan Lake. We're um, happy to see that uh, you have survived because, like I said, I've been by there so many times and it was still closed and it was like, uh, it's adorable. Your shop is absolutely Thank you. adorable. And so with that, if people want to find out more information, how can they do so? Um, they can follow our social media accounts for like latest information on like you know what kind of classes we're offering we do more than just the woodwork especially see classes as well so um on instagram or facebook um sylvan lake um board and brush and then also you can go to our website it's boardandbrush.com backslash sylvan lake um you can see our calendar you can contact us directly from there and you can even just browse our gallery and see what different type of project offerings we have well it's been great talking to you we appreciate your time today Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on. What a great event uh, to get involved with. But for so many people, especially offices, everyone's been working remotely, trying to bring people together in a situation or like a setting like this is a good way to reconnect your team. Yeah, it is. It's a great way to reconnect the team and, you know, maybe, you know, personalize the office environment a little bit more. Everybody's making their own little artwork they can put on their desk and put around the office, you know, bring a little bit of that home feel back into the office environment. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Just about uh, 20 minutes left here in the show. A fascinating um, guest joining us next. Danielle Boyer will be with us. She is the founder of the Steam Connection. Talk about a fascinating young lady. We'll be talking to her next year on the Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life.
Welcome back to the Friday edition of the MegaCast. We've made it through another week, Tyler. Yes, we have. Another week down and uh, one more interesting interview to do today before we call it a week and return Monday at 10 a.m. And we are ending the week with a fascinating interview. Uh, Danielle Boyer joins us now on the MegaCast. She's the founder and CEO of the Steam Connection. So great having you with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Danielle, before we jump into the STEAM uh, connection, how old are you? I'm 20 years old. And I'm sorry to ask you that because I know, you know, I went to <laughs> college in the South and you're never supposed to ask a lady their age. Oh, I don't mind. But you have done so many great things and you're only 20. What motivates you? That is an interesting question because Honestly, so much contributes to what motivates me, but the biggest thing that motivates me is my students. I'm an educator. Um, my nonprofit, The Steam Connection, is based around teaching kids and working with kids in the community. And so my students drive me to do what I do every single day and talking to them and working with them. It's just what lights my world up. 20 years old. Tell us more about uh, The Steam Connection. So the STEAM Connection is the nonprofit that I founded in the beginning of 2019, which sounds crazy now, it feels like a world away. Um, but I founded it when I was a little bit younger, obviously, but um, I uh, had been on a robotics team for a really long time at International Academy East. And I saw how great the uh, programs that we we're putting on impacted the community, like uh, STEM tutoring programs, things like that, uh, technical education. Uh, robotics programs, uh, letting the kids drive the robots, wire things. And I was like, I want to continue to do this even after I graduate. So I founded my nonprofit. Uh, STEAM stands for Science, Tech, Engineering, Art, and Math. And um, in that same month, I launched six books and one robot. And so I have not stopped since then. <laughs> I, I feel like I've done nothing with my life and I'm a lot older than 20, but what's it been like for you uh, doing this journey? Because you're impacting and sparking imagination in the hearts of these kids. Well, it's exciting because I get to combine my passions uh, for helping others and making things every single day. I'm actually speaking to you right now from my headquarters um, of the STEAM Connection. And as you can see, I've kind of decked out the entire room. I have little robots everywhere. I have a gecko robot. I have my art on the walls. Um, my students come in person um, sometimes, but mostly now because of the pandemic virtually. And um, I get to teach kids every day, and I also get to invent new robots all the time and work on new projects, and it's super exciting. I love it. <laughs> How do you build a robot virtually? Uh, so that was a really huge learning curve for me because even in person, it can be difficult, but I'll actually show you. So this is one of my robots. Its name is Every Kid Gets a Robot, and it's a robot that costs less than $20 and is sent to kids for free. Um, I, I say the robot has driven farther than me because it's actually gone to tens of thousands of kids in more countries than I've ever been. Um, but what's really cool is that um, I can teach it virtually. I ship the robot kits individually to the kids and uh, we assemble them on like Zoom, which is insane. I even teach the kids how to wire robots on Zoom. I didn't think that was possible, but it is possible. And it's so cool to see the robots like working and moving even when I'm not there in person. So with that, uh, Danielle Boyer with us here on the MegaCast. She's the founder and CEO for the STEAM Connection. Danielle, I know at the heart of your nonprofit, it's about trying to diversify the industry as well and attracting different voices to the industry. How do you go about doing that? Well, uh, I think it's so important to make uh, technical the technical space a representative one. Um, not only for my students, but also for like college students and professionals as well. Um, I know when I've walked into different engineering spaces, sometimes I'm the only woman and it's, it's a little crazy. You definitely feel like you, you stand out and you don't belong. And I wanted to create a space that uh, where every kid belonged and where every kid knew that they mattered and were represented in that space. And so um, I can't always say the same for other spaces, but within um, the STEAM connection, um, the kids see artwork that represents them. Um, they have uh, mentors and teachers who represent them. 
we're all, our entire organization, we're minority run, which is really cool. And we're all students, which is even crazier. And we just want to give our students um, the role models that we never had. So talking about that, we're students. Are you in college now? Yes, I am. Uh, I just finished a program at the University of Vermont in neurodevelopmental disabilities for youth. And that was really cool. It was like a fellowship program with an awesome mentor. I loved it. Did you, was it in person or virtual? It was all virtual. I was so thankful. I'm like, I can still work and, you know, do the program too. I, I, I'm sitting here. I'm like, you're a super smart kid, aren't you, Danielle? I, I try. <laughs> I study a lot. I try. And, and so with that, where do you want to see the STEAM connection go? Well, I want to see the robots continue to reach many kids around the world. And I want kids to know that they belong in technical education, that they belong in robotics, and they belong in engineering and software development. I want kids to know that. And so um, I see myself making robots for a really long time and bringing in even more awesome people to help with that. And uh, yeah, I see, I see the robots, as I said, driving onward uh, even farther than me. <laughs> and with that, too, um when you've been able to reach some kids and they built their first robot, mm -hmm. what was that experience like for them? Oh, it was so, so cool. You get to see the kids like faces light up as their robot works. And um, then they go on and they <laughs> tell me that they like have, uh, they chase their pets with them and that they edit them and add like lights and things and reprogram them. And that's the coolest thing ever to hear that the robots are like doing more even beyond just the classes that I teach. And I always, I get pictures from the kids of how they've decorated them and what they've learned since then. A lot of kids have gone on to start their own initiatives, their own podcasts, their own nonprofits, and they're all younger than me. It's wild. <laughs> See, you are what is right about the kids today. You know, so many people kind of complain about the kids. Look, she's amazing. You are absolutely amazing. How did you, oh, you. get interested? and STEM? So um, I was actually 10 years old and I saw that my little sister was interested in science and technology. Um, we were homeschooled though and at our homeschool group there were no classes offered like that. And I was like, there has to be something better, right? So one day I was at the, the store, I was at Costco and I saw animal puppets. And I was like, mom, what if I taught an animal science class? And she's like, dude, you're 10 years old. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 listen, listen. I could like make my own coloring sheets. Like I, I can do this. Um, I learned a lot in the process, but I learned most of all that I love teaching kids and I love especially robotics. And I love, um, you know, creating educational materials and things. And um, I, as I said before, I've not stopped since then. But how important is it to be able to reach kids of all different backgrounds? Because the one thing through the pandemic we have learned is about the inequities within our education system and trying yes. to get everyone involved and uh, you know this arena. So how has it been a challenge for you to try to reach some of those kids? So accessibility is one of my biggest focuses for every single kid. That's why I took the Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program. I wanna make sure that every kid's represented and every kid has an opportunity to learn and to be able to pursue what they love. Um, one of the biggest focuses for us was the problems centering around Wi-Fi uh, access. Because a lot of kids, especially in rural communities, uh, especially rural indigenous communities, don't have access to it. And I'm indigenous, so it really, really matters to me a lot. And so um, I was like, what if we put the robots on a pre-programmed loop and the kids can still wire everything, they can still assemble everything, um, but we do not need internet access. And we started rolling that out and it's actually in effect and it's working and the kids can build their own robots without internet access. So the, the points of accessibility is just so important to me because some kids get left behind and um, our world is becoming increasingly more technical. We need people in tech um, in every single industry and we need everyone to exist at the same level in tech so that they can thrive in their future careers. Since starting your nonprofit, how has this opened up your world? 
That is a very big question. Um, it's really cool because I get to work with many awesome people. I actually just came back from Seattle where I was behind the camera for like the first time in forever. And I was uh, shooting a campaign for um, my nonprofit and we're doing a series on tech and tradition. So it intersects um, like cultures and our unique cultures, but it also shows our unique careers too. And so I got to photograph our board members um, Michelle and Varun, and it was really fun. Uh, Varun is a microbiologist and Michelle's an electrical engineer, so I got to take pictures of them. So with that, I know that you gained a lot of uh, national attention because mm -hmm. yeah. of this effort as well. What's that been like for you? Oh, it is so special. Um, I got to be in the L'Oreal Paris Women of Worth NBC special, and I got to do it with uh, one of my students, which was so cool. I got to do it with my student, Vinia. Um, that was the coolest thing. We got to build robots together and drive them around in the park. Um, I'm also one of people's girls changing the world. My mom actually took the picture that ended up in the magazine, which was just so, so special. Um, it, it's, it's just so cool to be able to um, see my work impact others in more ways than I thought was possible. And um, to also, you know, represent my culture and to show kids that, you know, um, they can pursue what they love to. So I know you have a podcast. Do you want to, yes, uh, yeah. where can people find that? What do you talk about? So my podcast is actually with the student that I just mentioned, uh, Vinia. She's 13 years old, which is insane. Wow. Uh, we just recorded another episode um, yesterday and it's called Hands On Techie Talks. Uh, where, wherever podcasts are um, uploaded, wherever your favorite is. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, Audible. Um, and we talk about environmental innovation for kids. And we talk about how to use like technology for good and how to treat others with kindness through tech and through science. And it's really fun. Um, we just talked about um, uh, biorobotics, which is my uh, like, des like career destination goal, you know, is building robots that are like animals. So and what is your uh, career goal? Uh, to definitely um, one day have a show where I can build robots with people all around the world and kids all around the world and uh, learn about animals at the same time. So animals and robots, that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're definitely passionate and you can see it uh, in your face. Your, your face lights up when you talk about robots. I never knew robots were so cool. They are so cool. You can, honestly, the robots are so fun. You can have robots that emulate animals, robots in manufacturing, robots in so many different ways. It is the coolest thing in the world. I love it. You mentioned that you have a sister. Is uh, she as interested in science like you? She's actually, she just got into the University of Michigan and she's going to be pursuing teaching. That is great. Uh, so with that, uh, you're homeschooled? Yeah, most of my life, yeah. So for uh, you, like all of us have been freaking out over the past year because so many kids have, you know, <laughs> had to to learn remotely. For you, that was uh, probably pretty normal, right? Yeah, whenever I hear, hear someone like, oh my gosh, I'm homeschooled now, I'm like, it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird hearing everyone say that now because I totally got made fun of uh, for it uh, when I was in public school. Like, I joined middle sophomore year. I totally got made fun <laughs> for it. So, yeah. But, now it's a cool thing, I guess. <laughs> but who, now who homeschooled you? Was it your mom? Yeah, yeah. Well, did she have a teaching background at all? Nope, no, um, she is an artist, so it was, it was definitely an interesting environment. Um, it was really cool though, like I got to learn with my sister and we got to participate in a homeschool group. Um, we, we did like art every morning, that's how we woke up and um, yeah, it was really interesting. My dad's an engineer, so I kind of, I like to think I have the blend of both of their backgrounds. You definitely seem to, and I will tell you, your mom did an amazing job. Because oh, it, she'll be happy to hear 20, that. <laughs> I mean, you're 20. And you have already done so much because when you're looking and talking about, oh, I'm going to start a nonprofit, did roadblocks get in your way at all? What advice would you give to other young people? Um, I have to say that if you see a problem or you see a challenge that exists in your community and no one else is solving that problem, why not do it yourself? Um, I've, I've always thought that way and I encourage others to think that way too because we need young people making a difference and we need 
young people speaking up for what you know matters to them and um it, it can be kind of discouraging at times you know sometimes people speak down to you because of how um you know young you are sometimes um you know people underestimate you but honestly i think there's a power in sometimes being underestimated um, because you can walk into so many spaces and um, you can share your opinions and you can create the change that you want to see. And um, it, it a lot has changed over the years and um, I've been able to do more than I ever thought was possible. And I really encourage others to pursue what they love and to advocate for the change that they want to see. I know that uh, you were recently the cover story for uh, the charity American Indian Science and Engineering Society. And it's my favorite charity. I love them so much. They're so cool. Uh, what is it about that charity that speaks to your heart? Uh, because when I walk into their conferences and see their beautiful intertribal community, I know I belong and I know that I'm going to find so many people with similar interests to me and similar backgrounds too. Um, it is so cool. I get to meet people with backgrounds in research and backgrounds in biorobotics too. And um, we get to share our love for our cultures and share our love for STEM too. And it's just so, so beautiful. I love it. I've been able to put on different events through ACES. I've been able to do different speaking engagements there. And it is just so cool. Every time I walk into the space, I know that it's going to be an amazing time. Danielle Boyer with us here on the Megacast. She's the founder and CEO of the Steam Connection. You're 20 years old. What is next for you? So I'm currently working on an invention. Um, so my main robot is called Ecker. Every kid gets a robot. And I'm working on a new project called Ecker Biobots which is intersecting biodegradability and robotics. I can't say a lot about it, but I'm working on this new invention and it was just, uh, we just got funding from Verizon and the Clinton Foundation through their social innovation challenge. So I've been working on cooking up a new invention um, so that kids can manufacture their own robots no matter where they're from. I like that, cooking up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Mad scientist time. <laughs> and uh, how has it been for you to try to get some of these projects funded? It has definitely been difficult, especially during the pandemic, um, to get funding and backing. Um, but uh, we've had a lot of really great supporters like Dasso Systems, who creates the software that we use to make the robots, and uh, like Ulta Beauty donated through the L'Oreal Paris Woman of, Pro Woman of Worth program. It's, it's just so amazing. And the support really does mean a lot because these projects are expensive. We give away everything for free. So yeah, we definitely appreciate all the support that we can get. So are you working out of your house or do you actually have a space that you work out of? I actually have a space. This is our headquarters. It is uh, just a room where we have like our 3D printer, our soldering station. We have um, a bunch of electrical diagrams on the wall and I'm sitting at a, a workbench that is just covered in robots. I have a toilet paper tube robot. I have Legos. I have wiring diagrams, screws. I, everything, I have everything. <laughs> We've had uh, a couple people on talking about the 3D printers. Uh, mm. Those, they're so cool. I mean, they are. what do you do with yours? So actually the, the robots that I uh, design are 3D printed um, in a bioplastic called PLA. Um, and I'm showing a uh, chassis right now. So the chassis is the body of the robot uh, for every kid gets a robot. People think that it kind of looks like Batman and I kind of I kind of see where they're coming Hello. from. And um, I made it as simple as possible so that the kids could stick all the elements onto one body. So like the battery, the brain of the robot, which is like the microcontroller, um, the motor, stuff like that. And then they can put the wheels on from there and they can just start, you can start driving it on your phone. So, uh, Danielle, with it being a nonprofit, I'm sure you can always use donations. And if someone is listening or watching right now, how can they find out more about uh, your nonprofit? You all can learn more about the STEAM Connection at our website at www.steamconnection.org. We're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for supporters. Uh, we have free open source robotics materials, too, if you want to just start making robots. And we always appreciate donations because we do give all of our resources out for free. If you just want to start making robots. Yeah, just you know, casually making robots. Yes. <laughs> Make some robots with us. That would be interesting. It would. Uh, Danielle, it has been such a pleasure talking with you today. We so appreciate your time.
Thank you so much for having me. We wish you the best of luck. You are going great places, big places. We can uh, see it already. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> she's so fun. Yes. Yes, what a great thing that's, that, that, she's, that she's doing, helping a lot of these kids get into an industry where, you know, like, like she had said, it, it's, it's, very much a, it's very much an industry that, that looks a lot alike. And, you know, in, in our times now, trying to change that and trying to be more inclusive. And she's actually on the front lines making that happen and inspiring this next generation of kids across all different kinds of backgrounds to get into science, technology, arts, and mathematics and actually put those concepts into action. You know, the saying goes, if you can see it, you can be it. Exactly. And we need everyone to understand that, uh, you know, open up your world. She is changing lives. She is. She is changing lives. You never know, um, you know, that one interaction could be, you know, sparking the beginning of the next big scientist for us. Mm -hmm. So it's been a pleasure having her. Again, Danielle Boyer, founder CEO for the STEAM Connection. That is it for us. This week of the Megacast uh, wraps up. We will be back here bright and early, 10 a.m. Monday morning, everyone. Have a great weekend.